Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard McCabe, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this lunchtime lecture sponsored by the Friends of the Bodley. For those of you who don't know, the Friends is an organization that helps to raise uh, money for acquisition and conservation. And our members have also been very generous in the recent campaign to keep Oxford reading during the lockdown. So if you're not a member and would like to join, you will find links on our website and I would encourage you to, uh, to join us. Now, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Sadie Jones, who as many of you will know, is a very eminent novelist and screenwriter. Her first novel, The Outcast, was published in 2008. And prior to that, Sadie worked in a number of jobs in both Paris and London while writing film scripts. And you'll of course find that the uh, cinematic quality um, uh, is one of the remarkable features of her prose. The Outcast won the Costa First Book Award in 2008 and was shortlisted for the Orange Prize. For those of you who are uh, TV uh, addicts, it was also a Richard and Judy Summer Reads uh, number one bestseller and subsequently adapted uh, for BBC television. A second novel, Small Wars, was published in 2009 and long listed for the Orange Prize. Uh, other novels followed in quick succession, The Uninvited in 2012, Fallout in 2014, and most recently, The Snakes in 2019. And Sadie has a particular connection with the Bodley because it holds the archive of her father, Evan uh, Jones, the poet and novelist, playwright, and screenwriter. And today, uh, Sadie is going to talk to us about one of the most vital aspects of the creative progress, um, uh, process, and that is revision. Her lecture is aptly titled, The Only type of writing is rewriting and I'm passing over to her right now. I'm sure you will give her a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That's um, and thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's, it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, it's also very strange uh, <laughs> to be sitting in my study where I sit alone, not talking to anybody, talking to a lot of um, imaginary people. But uh, when the Bodleian very kindly asked me to give this lecture, they um, asked me what subject I would like to speak on. And the only subject in my mind, the only subject that I really am quite obsessed by at the moment is rewriting and revising, as I'm currently still revising the novel that I wrote the first draft of, it was only two years ago, or started it in, in 2019. Um, and I'm, I'm about on the fifth draft and certainly since before lockdown, that has been my life. So there's that, um, it was really wonderful for me to be able actually to look at other writers' processes. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. This is my, <laughs> an attempt at tech, an attempt at comedy. <laughs> I thought with the title, the only kind of writing is rewriting and then I thought, but is that the best title? Maybe writing is rewriting. And I thought to write is to rewrite. And then I had that thing where I couldn't even see the words anymore. And it just, I had to hyphenate it. And then I thought on rewriting, that sounds, so I'm, I'm really just um, being silly because uh, it, it's really not, um, not the point at all. Uh, the title, as you'll know, uh, probably is a is a quotation from Hemingway, um, who was famous for his revisions, and his working and reworking and revising his work. And I just wanted to talk about um, a couple of his books that were published posthumously. Um, I'm a huge Hemingway fan, but I'm not a Hemingway scholar. Um, I'm not really a scholar of any writer, in that I. I'm not, I'm not so much not interested in biography as I dislike the curiosity that comes with it. I begin to get caught up in the writer's life and I prefer the um, purity, I suppose, of just the right, what's on the page, working with what's on the page and interpreting that. So this has been a very sort of 
um, conflicting experience for me because in looking into these manuscripts and, and how they've been changed, um, it necessarily becomes about the state of mind of the writer or the state where the writer was in their life. So I've been um, intrigued and also reluctant in my research and you must forgive my biographical errors, uh, particularly about Hemingway um, as he was such a self mythologizer. Um, he, all the stories about him, including those that he told, are so um, many and varied. You can't, you can't quite know what's, what's true. Uh, this is a manuscript for a book that had the working title, Merlin of Cuba, as well as, well as other working titles. Um, I, I, it's so exciting to see and to, I'm sure any writers watching this can absolutely recognize this kind of, the writing down the margins, the crossing out, the writing on the back of the page. Um, it's, it's a fascinating thing to look at. Um, the two books I want to talk about, one of them is The Old Man in the Sea and uh, the other one is Islands in the Stream. The Old Man in the Sea is a um, perfect example of his extremely spare, pared down, simple, deceptively simple, beautifully rhythmic poetic prose that is so raw and seems to have just arrived on the page. Um, and it was, though it was published after his death, he referred to it uh, as a piece of writing that he felt required only a light scalpel. I think it was, it was ready. Uh, whereas Islands in the Stream, um, I think it was 464 pages long. It's a book that I personally disliked intensely. It's everything, it's, it's like Hemingway on Hemingway on Hemingway. Um, and I wasn't surprised to find that it was in fact edited. Um, and that I think the choice to have it published was his widow, Mary, who she edited it and she cut it down a great deal. But he was known for cutting, you know, perhaps 60% of his work. Um, and it was not well received. She was trying to redress the balance that his, his later books had, had given him some bad press. Um, and she was trying to redeem his reputation. Uh, but I read a journalist who said, um, they said, Hemingway's wife said that she removed certain portions of the book she felt certain Hemingway himself would have, would have eliminated, which begs the question, why would he include them in the first place? Um, and that seemed to me to be sort of ungenerous and also um, unimaginative because if a writer were to only try to write the things that are gonna stay in the book, the terror of the blank page would be so enormous and the impossibility of doing such a thing. You have to, <laughs> and I'm speaking for Hemingway here, you have to have the, um, courage to write badly or to write foolishly or to, to, to be, to disinhibit yourself by writing long. Um, and so I very much uh, disagree with or dislike the idea that a writer should only be putting their best on the page. I think there, there would just be um, no such thing. Uh, he not only was famous for cutting his work, um, but also, oh, about those two books. Um, what was extraordinary to me, which I did not know, was that both um, The Old Man and the Sea and Islands in the Stream were part of this trilogy or epic that he was writing um, over 15 years. Um, and The Old Man and the Sea was, as a really a novella, was not supposed to be a book on its own, but he was working in sections and portions. I found that really interesting. And I would not have dreamt reading both books. I, I would never know that they had come from essentially the same book or the same series of books. Uh, so as well as 
being so well known for his cutting everything and being so brutal with his own writing, um, which is a fascinating thing psychologically, any way to be so harsh. Um, he's also known for revising and making changes. And he famously said that he rewrote the ending of A Farewell to Arms um, 39 times, 39 separate endings, he said. And I, I wonder if that was, I always assume everybody's read A Farewell to Arms. Um, and I think he's so unfashionable, a lot of people haven't. But I always wonder if that's, you know, perhaps because he couldn't face the perfect sorrow of what the ending of the book is, or how that, you know, was he rewriting just those sentences where they're really separate endings? Um, it's, it's very interesting to me. Um, and it, what really stuns me is that when you read the last line of that book, uh, you can't believe that a sentence with such lightness and such clarity that seems to come with perfect logic and chronology from what's come before and is such an ending and, and, and such an ongoing, it seems so fluid. Um, it speaks of his, the genius of, of him. I just, um, it's, the, it's a beautiful last line. Uh, so, I w yes, that's that. And then, um, that, was, that was really what I wanted to, that's really cutting, the cutting side of revisions. Um, Truman Capote called, his uh, called his his version of of what Hemingway called his scalpel. He called the scissors, and he says, "I believe in the scissors more than I do the pencil," which um, I I like very much. Uh, and it's it's often so much about um, the editing of things, making them shorter, making them making the words live on the page. And there's, there's so much, so many quotes in literature about brevity. And um, I think Mark Twain stole that one and lots of people have, have been said to have said it. But it's true that when one writes very often or speaks in my case, rambling, using too many words, going on too long. Uh, and it's the going back and the honing and the trimming that really, um, and this again, this quote, it speaks to me of the brutality of writers to their own work. There's a thing which um, I think all of us do, all of us writers, uh, when you're writing and you think you're being marvelous, there's a moment where you think, oh yes, this is terribly good. And I'm using these wonderful words and I really love that sentence. And it's very often those bits there's the kill your babies thing that um, has been said, and I forget who said it, but there's also just this idea that when you stand out of yourself and you look at it and, you, and you're proud of it is the moment when you're losing your truth. And I think that that's, um, I think that's an important uh, thing to recognize as a writer as well. Um, so that's really the editing and chopping side of things. And then there's the rewriting, which I, I think of as the uh, discovering or um, uh, realizing of the piece of work, which is much less, um, much less brutal, certainly, and much more subtle. This is um, a page from uh, Frankenstein, which has been uh, edited by Mary Shelley so delicately, and it seems like it's a, a much more um, a writerly, very it's a it's a sort of quiet way that she's approaching her her page. Uh, 
everybody knows the story, I think, of how Frankenstein came about, you know, by Lake Geneva and Byron and Percy Shelley and then uh, Mary Wollstonecroft. And um, they were set the task of writing a ghost story or a frightening story. And she apparently had this dream. But I hadn't known that there were these two versions of the book I probably should have known. Um, it was first published in 1818 and uh, then later and much more successfully, or it was successful to begin with, but it was also notorious and anonymous and sort of reviled. Um, but then the 1830 publication is the one that we all read, most of us read. And I'm very interested in two things about it. First of all, the original, the, the writing and the, the bodily and have this in their collection. I only realized too late, so I don't have the high res. I, some of these images I do. Um, there, that's a bodily and one that's better. Uh, there's Percy Shelley's notes on it, which um, tend to be in the margins. And then there are hers. And there, she was a very young woman. She was 18. And a lot of her revisions to this early manuscript are, um, you know, things like um, changing things from uh, when Victor Frankenstein sees, sees the monster in a flash of lightning, and she has changed it to, I saw emerging from the gloom, where she seems to be sort of taking down the Gothic element of it. Um, and other moments where she's being more sophisticated with her language, where she's used beautiful a lot about mountains, and so she then describes them as supreme and magnificent. And I love this one. Um, it was enveloped in, a, in pitchy darkness, which she changed to impenetrable. Um, it's, it's a fascinating thing to see. Um, and I think the, the book was written very quickly. Uh, I don't know how many, how many handwritten pages there were that were rewritten and at what point there's a fair copy of that. Um, but the later version um, is a slightly more Victorian book. She, when she wrote the book originally, she had just lost a baby. And it's a sort of, I often think of Frankenstein as a sort of dreadful wish fulfillment of putting life into this dead creature, um, a sort of monstrous amalgamation of trying to create something out of out of pain and death but it's a it's a it's a very much a um it condemns frankenstein and it's a book about hubris and it was you know it was called a, a subtitle was prometheus and it it has a a much more raw quality even though she didn't change it very much for the later version she started revising the book, immediately she'd finished it. And I, I imagine, and I, again, my ignorance and my, imagine, my imagination far outreaches my knowledge. But it seems to me that uh, what were refinements in her later revision for the publication that had her name on it and her husband's name on it, and it was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, it was a, a book that doesn't condemn Frankenstein so much. It's more understanding of him. It's slightly more of a morality tale. He doesn't abandon his creature. Um, the book always has this tremendous sympathy and love for the creature. But in the, the version we know better, um, there's, a, there's almost an apologia to her introduction to it, when she says, how I then, a young girl, came to think and to dilate upon so very hideous an idea. And she explains that it was a dream that she had and the people around her. And she almost seems to be distancing herself in a way from the harshness of her book. And she had lost I think three more children by then. Her husband had just died. She was a 
widow, widow, widow in Victorian England, taking care, more care than as a very young woman, I imagine, of, of her reputation and of her future. And it seems that she's sort of trying to somehow be more dignified and distance herself from the rawness of the book. And luckily she doesn't make too many changes and luckily she doesn't do that too much. But it struck me that it's another, another way in which people approach revision is also to do with their reputation as well as the truth of the book. And in thinking about uh, Frankenstein and um, monsters and how writers see their work, I had an idea, um, it came into my mind, uh, it came into my mind, a thing that Toni Morrison said uh, that occurred to me, this whole Frankenstein making a monster thing. Uh, she said, it's a, it's a wonderful thing about failure and it's to do with the physicality of writing and the idea of the writer as when she says it's as though you're in a laboratory and you're working on an experiment with chemicals or with rats and it doesn't work, it doesn't mix. You don't throw up your hands and run out of the lab. What you do is you identify the procedure and what went wrong and then correct it. And I, it, it was, I've often thought of this line and reading about Frankenstein, it struck me, of course, when you're building a book, you're taking these parts and these sections and these bits and you're trying to animate them. Um, and it's very easy to become catastrophic in your thinking about whether a thing is a failure or a success because you're trying to animate a dead thing and you're trying to have the words come alive in front of you. And when that doesn't work, you can easily feel that you have failed. And I, I love this for its, um, for its practicality and its lack of vanity. And I, um, Tony Morrison was an editor at Random House for many years, as I'm sure you'll know, and also um, taught a class, gave presentations, talked a lot about revisions, revising work, how, how, it, how it happens, you know, getting out the toolbox. And she talks about not teaching her students about passion, not teaching them about talent, hoping that they will bring those things, but she teaches them about the craft of it, the tools of it, how you, how you will then mold the thing and make it better and make it work. And about um, her book, The Bluest Eye, uh, she had to, or wanted to, or did revisit it and revise it significantly. I think this is a page from um, Paradise, I'm not sure. Um, but about Bluest Eye, she said that it was a pleasure to do that much work to it, that she hadn't known she would have to do it, but she wasn't intimidated by it because that, that's her job. Um, and I, I thought that that was uh, inspiring and, and extraordinary. And I, I love her not having any interest in, in mythologizing herself or, or being a mystery. She's got that yellow legal pad up there and, and, and she's, she's showing it, which is a terrifying, thing to do if you're somebody who is frightened of the page, I think as most of us are. Um, and I, it, well, it made me think I'm gonna have to talk about revising my own book a little bit. Um, and what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do was um, talk about the revisions to my second book, uh, and show a page of that because it would be less nerve wracking. Um, but then I had a clear out earlier this year, did a lockdown clear out and I threw away, I used to keep, I always, I, I write on the screen and then I print 
my drafts and then I do handwritten corrections and then I put it, put it back into the computer and then I print it out again and have many times. And I had all of my manuscripts for all of my five, nearly six books. And I just thought, I don't need these. Nobody wants to see them. I don't want to see them. What's the point in this? It's just self-indulgent and messy. And I threw them all away. And, um, and then this opportunity came up to talk about revisions. And I, my first thought was, oh, small wars. I'd love to show that page because you, you remember these things. And I don't have it. And I, it's going to be very difficult to forgive myself for having done that. But what I do have um, is my new, the manuscript I'm working on at the moment and a page that I've revised only just recently. Okay, so this is a page of mine. Um, it's a book about two young children growing up in the countryside and it's in their, it's in their voice. Um, both their voices, this is uh, the little boy. And in writing those voices, I necessarily had to write very long. Um, they're very chatty. They're always, you know, this is about their Halloween. It's at the beginning of the book. They're having an amazing time and there's a bonfire and they're doing this and they're doing that. And so it had to have this kind of pace and verbosity and limited vocabulary and, and little repetitions of words. And I had a lovely time. And, <laughs> and then I looked back at it and I cut it. The first draft was probably 125,000 words. It's now around 80. Um, and this page was probably two pages and here it's half a page. Um, and you can see I've, I've, I've crossed out. We aren't even scared when we gallop outside and, and it's dark, uh, which I've changed to we gallop outside in the dark uh, because it, it just, um, there's a difficult balance that I'm trying to find between um, truthfulness, um, there is similitude and um, not being arch and not being cute and yet having the essence of being young, it's really hard to do. I'm having a difficult time with it. Um, and and that the, we need to be able to, I'm really getting the bonnet up here to talk about this, I hate it. Um, but we need to be able to find the story, the adult story, the story that's being told in the chat and the children grow up through the book, but when they're very young um, to write where uh, they have noticed things and we notice things, but without doing it in a clunky way is quite tricky. So it's, it's, it's been difficult. And this is uh, what that passage became. Um, and ironically in doing this, I rewrote again, because there were things that I missed. Um, I'm going to read it, I think. We gallop outside into the dark and the smells of wood smoke and fallen apples, our black clothes flapping. Then the cold bonfire is above us, much darker than the sky. A torch flashes and Fimbar comes out from behind like a scarecrow. So kids, give me a hand with this tarp, he says. We pull at the pegs and knots and the grown-ups come out of the house and all squelch down the hill with the food and the lanterns. Mum is the only one not doing any work because having a baby is so exhausting, even if Nia sleeps nearly the whole time. She's like a small potato. Mum sits on the log and Jim keeps saying, how are my girls? How's my baby? I don't mind he's so crazy about Nia. We all are. Every single person who sees her is amazed because she's new, even if she is just the same as a potato. It's just that I don't remember Bryn and Eden being born. They're my sisters, and I don't think about it. Nia makes me remember I'm not Jim's real son. I mean, she makes me notice it. I don't mind that. It's fine. So um, often, uh, reading a thing out is the only way to know where you would make cuts or what you would do, uh, because in your head, you can sort of get away with things. You can imagine a thing will sound OK. Um, and there's a rigor to having to read it out. I normally don't have to do it to strangers. <laughs> I'm normally just in my room, um, but I will nearly always read out what I'm writing. And if I don't want to, it can be a sign that I'm scared of how it will sound. Um, 
So uh, that's that. And then uh, it struck me too, uh, in talking about all these writers who revise so much, uh, I was thinking about um, writers who, who plan and how the more you plan, perhaps, uh, the less you have to revise. I don't know if that's true. There are times um, Alice Walker talks about this. She says that she doesn't, or said that she doesn't revise that much um, because she will write a chapter in her head. She'll write a chapter in her head over a couple of weeks and then put it down. And I, I recognize that and I admire that, I envy that. And it's also a useful tool to sit and make a rule for oneself not to write in order to put down considered piece of writing. But I think that um, that's a slightly different thing than planning. Um, Dickens was a famous planner. He was known for uh, his, his very structured and considered um, the way that he, he put his stories together. And uh, there's this page from um, Oliver Twist, which was a book he planned meticulously. Uh, I, I wanted the first page, I couldn't find it. Um, it just, looking at this, it seems to me, his handwriting is very, um, there's a flow and a confidence to it and it has it's, it's spaced and nice rhythms and the strikeouts are very confident. No, I don't want that there. I'm changing that slightly. This is the thing I'm writing. And he's just, he seems really together. Whereas uh, with Great Expectations, he did not plan that book. <laughs> and oh, I wish I had a higher res uh, image for this. And I'm really sorry that I don't. But this is this seems to me a very very different situation for a writer. He's his writing is washed up, and he's changing many more things. And he's, I believe, there were many more drafts. And again, I'm not a scholar, and people are probably so irritated by my vagueness in this because I'm just applying ideas to, as I say, this um fairly not reluctant research out of lack of curiosity, but reluctant in that I um, don't want to be swept away by, by reality. But from what I know, this is, um, this, and from what I can see, this was a much, a very different prospect. Uh, the page was a very different thing to him with this book. Uh, so, I, we have a few more minutes. We're going to do a Q and A, um, and I really have sort of come to the end of what I needed to say about revising. Um, except that I, I, while I was doing my reluctant investigations, I came upon the Russians, and I don't know if you'd just count Nabokov specifically as that, but I really just, I just, if we had longer, or I had had longer, I would love, I would love to go into this which is fantastic and then even better and I love that this is my favorite book um the Brothers Karamazov Dostoevsky that's extraordinary and I love the drawings Mary Shelley did drawings as well um and I I don't know if that was how he wrote or how he just how he planned or if he planned and I don't intend to find out but I love this image and um, I think it's I think it's wonderful. So uh, there, I think that's I think that's it. I think I've done that. I've managed not to drop offline or crash or freeze. So back to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sadie, for that uh, fascinating talk, which gave us so much to, to think about. Uh, I shall say a few words of appreciation at, at the very end, but my one request to you at the moment would be, don't do any more lockdown clearouts, because <laughs> that's what the bodily is 
or we're here to archive these things. So if you find yourself going to throw them out, think of us be before you do, and we'll, uh, we'll add to the archive. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'd like to invite uh, people to send uh, in the questions, and there's a facility, um, as uh, Richard Parfit said, for doing this. So I'm waiting for, for those to come through, and I shall read them out and, uh, uh, for you and put them to, to Sadie. I will regret forever throwing those throwing those things out. I don't know. I just don't know what I was thinking. It didn't even seem like that big a deal. It just seemed like a lot of mess. And and uh, I must have been in a very odd frame of mind. I blame COVID. Not that yes. I have it, but just the... <laughs> I, I think that's right. But it's interesting that you do print them out because I, I think one of the problems for archiving in the future will be that people don't, that they correct online and on the computer and so on. And there, there won't be, it won't be as easy to get to these. Mm -hmm. Oh, Which yeah. so, so often, you know, I do a lot of corrections online and a lot of changes online, and I tend to keep those drafts as well. But the handwritten ones are the key ones, I think. Yeah, uh, we're getting some questions now, uh, Sadie. And the first is: Do you ever uh, worry that editing makes your text worse? Always, yes. <laughs> and sometimes it does. And I, um, I don't know how happy I am with that passage I showed you, but an example there was when I was looking at it and I found the changes I'd made. Uh, the bit about the potato, I actually really like, and I'd sort of taken that out. It's a tiny thing, uh, mm -hmm. but you can, be, you can be too harsh with yourself. And also you, uh, you can, your eye can go out in a way where the words become meaningless because you've looked at them so often and so you, they don't have any freshness. You have no ability to be a reader anymore. I, I often fear I've made things worse, but um, you know, usually you you can go back to it, or you have to trust you have to trust your instinct that you is when I'm away from my desk, when I'm not working, I'll think, oh no, that sentence I shouldn't have lost that, or mm. I mean, even as much as yeah. commas, it's not I don't have to write these things down. The things that are true tend to stay in your mind, and those are the things that will haunt you if you if you think you've, you've made it worse okay well we have a question from chris fletcher he says um what do you make of one writer working on another's draft uh, in the way the shelleys did and do you let people look at yours or intervene in yours i i don't un until um really when i feel it's finished i think with the shelleys and I, it was a rabbit hole i could have really fallen very deeply down because of course we've all heard about their relationship and there are you know there's a there are arguments that he was you know there's a feminist argument that he was patronizing or because it's there's it's full of sort of um little affectionate terms his writing in the margins and it's very touching mm. uh, but he didn't um change her book mm. yeah. uh he really didn't change any the style of it i think I think for writers, whatever works, you know, there are writers who have writers groups and they hand one another drafts and they do. I'm terrified of that. I can barely trust my own taste. And once I start writing to committee, it's no good at all. But I respect anybody's process and whatever anyone thinks will help them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jane Bailey who says, do you re redraft with a different aspect in mind each time, for example, structure or plot or, or voice? That's such a good question. Yes. Um, it, it, yes, each draft is a reaction to the last draft. So I'll read, um, and sometimes it'll be a character. Um, once I'm working with my editor, then there will be sort of headline things uh, that we've both thought of. But when I'm on my own, I'll just, uh, you know, at the beginning, I'm pretty much just, well, that was terrible. That's, that wasn't what I wanted to say. But these things get more specific as they go on. And I'll often think this character is not realized. I'll be going in looking for that character and how to tell them better or um, make them more realized. Or if, if I feel that the tone is kind of relentless, so I'll go in looking for pace. Or yes, I do get, I do get very specific in what I'm looking for. 
Yes, thank you. And we have a very interesting question here from G. Taylor asking, when should you stop rewriting? Or perhaps how do you know when you should stop uh, rewriting? Uh, I always forget who said um, a book is never finished, it's just abandoned. Um, but it's true. And, you know, you can be, I can be reading at a book event and thinking, why did I leave that bit there? And you know, if I, if I could keep on fiddling away, I probably would. Uh, I, you sort of know when you're just taking commas out and putting commas back in, and you, and there's nothing that you can think of. And it, you never think, hurrah, this is perfect, but you do think that's the best I can do. There's a sort of, there's a sort of, okay, that I that's. I can't do any better feeling that is uh, I'm really looking forward to with this book. I think Samuel Beckett referred to a fidelity to failure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have another question um, asking, uh, as you do a lot of revising, does this mean you don't see yourself as a planner or how do you approach your first draft? Oh, I'm a huge planner. You are, yeah. And then, I'm, and then I revise the plan. Um, I'm not sure it, starting writing is very nerve wracking. And you, I have a feeling of wanting to build up a head of steam so that the, there's, so, it's, there's so much in the engine that you just have to start and you, I have to know where my ending will be. I don't plan exactly meticulous specific chapters. Um, I mean, sometimes I do, or but I I need to know my ending. I need to know my midpoint, and I need to really know who all my people are. And then after that, you know, even if I've done quite a detailed plan, I will often stop, go back, change the plan. I think the thing about planning is more that it's just um, giving you more information, giving you more mm. ingredients, giving you more to work with, because the really the very worst thing as a writer for me is a feeling of well, what what now who's who's this person mm. or the feeling that you're making it up i know that sounds ridiculous yeah i know what you mean but there's there's a, what i work for is a feeling of reporting a thing that has happened so if it if it means sitting quietly or if it means not writing, if it means planning and making lists, whatever it takes to have that feeling that you're reporting this event that's already taken place. Thank you. I mean, we have a, a question from Bonnie Blackburn asking, how do you react to editing by the publisher's editors? Um, I'm incredibly lucky. I have a wonderful editor, Clara Farmer, who's the publisher at Chatham. And she, I know that a lot of writers have very different or differing experiences, but um, we've worked on every book together. She's um, incredibly uh, rigorous whilst not being nitpicking, which is an amazing quality. And she has an ability to see what the book wants to be or what the book is at heart. And to just ask a question, she'll never sort of, do what I think of as sort of um, TV script editing type notes. She'll never say, you know, this needs to be stronger or turn that person into a Labrador. She'll just kind of, she'll say, so what about so-and-so? And I'll immediately think, oh yes, well, that's been bothering me. She's, she's really an extraordinary editor and she's very, very good on detail as well. Um, but I'm lucky about that. And I know a lot of people have, um, you can get can get different editors or um, not have such a happy experience. Yes, I suppose that's the point behind the question of what what happens when the, the editor seems to want to take the work in a direction that you yourself might not want to go. Have you you've never found yourself? Well, in I've, I have with um, with script work. I have, and it's very difficult, but it teaches you to hear what's a good note and what isn't. I don't think mm. Clara has probably always given me good notes. I think she probably says things that I discard. But if you can put aside, 
if you trust the editor and you can put aside the ego and not be defensive about it, or conversely, what I tend to do is go, you're right, I'll change everything. If you can just um, think of the note, a good note is like a present, somebody once said to me. You, you, know, you haven't had to think of it yourself. It's useful, it's helpful. And the bad note doesn't hurt. It, in the same way, if somebody says, it's like a criticism, if someone says, I didn't like this in your book, or if my editor says, I'm not sure about that, there's a feeling where you just think, no, well, I am, I know this. And that it doesn't, um, it's not upsetting in any way. Yes, we have another question here from Emily Patterson, which I think harks back to what you were saying about planning and that sort of thing. Um, do you think, um, uh, so, sorry for Trevor Arrowsmith, sorry, do, do you surprise yourself in what emerges during the rewriting? Uh, yes, um, very often. And in the writing, um, particularly with scenes, uh, with characters, you can, I can go into writing a situation where I have, for plot reasons, a very clear idea of what I want someone to feel or the way I want an argument, say, to go. Yeah. And then the characters, when it gets going and there's life to it and they're arguing or a thing happens, one of them turns out to be stronger than the other or turn it around. Or Those are wonderful. Those are the good surprises. Um, I think it's always good to be surprised by what you're writing because it means it's yeah, it's developing. It's yes, and it's coming from a truthful place. Yes, uh, Rosemary Dodd is asking: Do you think generally writers today are less keen to be edited by the publishers as they think they used to be decades ago? Do you think there's been a change in in attitude? I don't know. That's fascinating. I don't know. Very interesting question. Yes. Um, I think that editing has changed. I hear that editing has changed and that there's less and less of the, of editors doing line edits or detailed edits. Yeah. Um, and I think there's probably more of a, um, I know that there's more of a slant towards the marketplace um, and more of a feeling that, that they kind of know what they want, mm. perhaps. Mm. But I, I don't know if authors have changed in that way. I think authors, the authors of my acquaintance tend to be just really grateful to be in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, we have um, a question from Emily Patterson, uh, who says, do you think writers see cutting as a destructive act or a creative one? Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Um, I think creative is liberating, usually. Um, the thing with a cut, it can hurt, but you just don't miss it. There's a wonderful feeling where you think, should I cut this? Must you? Oh, I don't want, and then you, it's gone and you're so relieved that you haven't got this cumbersome, yeah. clunky thing. Um, I think it, it's creative in the way that um, sculpture's creative and that you're trying to get that Michelangelo quote about the sculpture being inside the marble. You're, you're mm. just trying to get to the work, yeah. so. Yes. Uh, we have an anonymous attendee, I, I mean, it's something we've covered before, but it's put in a slightly different way, but what happens before the rewriting from the idea to the page? How do you start the process in the sense when you have the idea, how do you, that blank page you were talking about, how do you? Uh, I, I will ask myself questions because an idea, usually it's such an amorphous weird thing it might just be a line that's stuck in your head or it might be an image or just sometimes almost just a sort of sense of something that you had when you you know and, you're, and you know it's an idea but you need to dig it out so i will uh, question myself and say well what was that what were you looking at or what had you heard or who might that be and i will just sort of do that and then begin to do that on the page and I will sort of do the big questions. When do, you, when do you think that happened? Or where do you think that happened? And if you ask a question, you get into, there's a, there's, then you're automatically in a, in a position where you're in a dialogue. And that's, for me, how to sort of beat the blankness. Okay, thank you. We have a few more questions I, we, have, we have just time for. Um, uh, Paul Rippon asks, do you have to fight hard not to use what you might call favorite words too often? And if so, how much uh, does this uh, feature in your rewriting? 
that's an excellent one too. Yes, completely. And I, looking at Mary Shelley, I, I really felt I was, there was beautiful everywhere and she kept taking beautiful out. Uh, I have, um, yes, certain words, little ticks, and it's horrible. I'm not even going, because once you, once you start hearing them in your mind, you just, you can become so critical um, and it can be quite stifling. Yes. So I have certain, I always remember a brilliant edit that Clara put in the margin of the outcast down in, she never would put lines through or red pencil or anything, but she wrote very nicely down the margin, too much light and dark. Mm. And that's an absolute yes. tell of mine that I will do the, I just, yeah. it's where I go. The light and the shadow, the, the yeah. things being dark, thing walking into the light. So I need to watch that. That takes us back to the Dr. Johnson quotation, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. Way, yes, uh, indeed. Um, Paula Collins asks, do you bring in friends and family? I mean, do you share drafts with friends and family and ask them for feedback and that sort of thing? I do um, when I think it's finished and I think it's ready to go to my agent because it will go to my agent first. And that's a frightening thing. Mm. That's when I will show it to close friends or my husband yeah. um, and, and see if they, it's really, is it a book? I don't want them to edit me. I just want to see yes. even things they don't say, just if they, if they seem bored, if, they, if they're moved, if they think it's at all funny, you know? So it's more sort of <laughs> reader's reaction. Some idea of it stepping out of the cupboard. Yeah. It's sort of reader's reaction that you're looking Absolutely. for to see how yeah. it is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Robert Wilson asks, uh, what about the age or experience of the writer? Is a young writer more likely to take advice? Uh, he thinks in particular of the young T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound or something like that. Mm. I think it, it depends very much on the development of the person and the person's ego. Um, as a very young writer, I was extremely, I was, I was very bad at school and hated being taught anything. I didn't want to be told how to write. I rejected all forms of instruction. I wouldn't read anything about how to do anything. I had the idea of being taught. So I only later and it was very unhelpful <laughs> yeah. and, but it did I suppose I was finding who I was as a writer but only later am I now able to be grown up about notes whereas I mean other other people are very different and you do having said that grow into a different sort of um, confidence where you do you do know yeah, you do when know. you're writing well well, I think that takes us perhaps to the last question I have before me, which is from Trevor Arrowsmith. And he, he asks about uh, how do you get to the stage when you realize that the changes you're making are actually quite trivial rather than significant? Uh, you know, that the, the minor things that might be left alone, but that you've made the significant changes. I mean, how do you determine on, on that point? Uh, I suppose gut instinct or a sort of inner tuning fork or um, sometimes, you know, it'll get down to punctuation, it'll get down to the rhythm of the sentence. There are things that'll keep coming back to you that you, you never liked. Sometimes a, a bigger change will come right at the end when you're fiddling with commas. Um, you just have to, uh, you just have to hope, you just have to hope that what you're reading yes. is what you wrote. Yeah. Sorry to be so vague. No, I think that's, very, that's a very interesting answer. Uh, I think that's all of the, the questions that we have in the Q&A at, at the moment. Uh, so, I mean, in conclusion, I'd just like to thank you, Sadie, for a really fascinating talk, and particularly for the courage to take us into your own working drafts, because I think very few writers would give us that sort of insight that you have, and uh, explaining the difficulties that you have to overcome and the way you overcome them so, so very carefully. And I, I think that was fascinating for many of us. I, I think we'll encourage people who perhaps in the audience are thinking of writing themselves and so on, because sometimes people think it has to be right the first time. I always tell students with this, with their essays and so on, you know, it is rewriting, as you were saying, not, not, not writing, that, that matters. Uh, but I think even more generally than that, I, I think you've given us a wonderful insight into the importance of the critical faculty 
in, uh, in creativity, the importance of being a self-critic and being able to bring some sort of objective judgment yeah. uh, on, on the process, which uh, could be a very subjective thing. Um, yes, I'm just seeing the comments in the Q&A at the moment. Thank you for really interesting and honest exploration. And I, I think that is what we appreciate um, most. And also from my point of view, I think the way you emphasized the craft of writing, that it's not just inspiration, that, that you need craft to, to fashion what you're inspired to write and, and to perfect it insofar as it, it can be perfected. So, yes. Sorry, did you want to? No, no, I'm, I'm just, yes. <laughs> but thank you so much indeed. It's been a great privilege uh, having you here. And uh, I think everyone will go away feeling that they have a much, much better sense uh, of the whole creative process now. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we're um, not able to, to clap in the way we usually do, but I would ask everyone in the uh, um, listening to us, and we, we have uh, just a hundred uh, participants, uh, to just clap where they are in appreciation um, of your talk today. So thank you very much indeed, Sadie. You're very, very welcome. And I was honored to be asked and thank you very much indeed. Thank you.